Welcome again to another edition of Ideas Hour. I'm your host, Paul Honeycutt, joined as always by Jeff Loker. Jeff, today's going to be kind of fun, I think. It's a little unscripted, as most of our conversations are. But one of the things that we do at In-Depth Studies, if you're local here in Phoenix or this area, is we do some regular, we call them discussion groups. What's interesting about the discussion groups is it's open to believers from all different churches if they want to come and talk. And we talk about specific topics. And the most re or next to most recent one we had was on the topic of how do we deal with doctrinal differences between believers. We had, as, as my count, was represent representatives of more than six churches at that one discussion group. And it was a very lively debate and discussion, but it begs the whole question. We thought it might be something to bring to the IDS Hour. You know, the, the number of questions come to mind, but... We, scripture tells us that we should have unity, we should seek unity, and yet when, if we're honest and, and, and been around the faith very long, we recognize there are a lot of differences in certain doctrines amongst believers. And the point of the discussion that we had that day, a two-hour discussion, was not so much, let's argue about the various differences, because we'd, we'd be, still be there. The, uh, the question was, how are we to deal with them? And, and the germination of the whole thing, I think, came from an article or blog by Albert Moeller. And he came up with, I think, a very unique, but a very, uh, I think, careful way of looking, of sort of strategizing, you know, those that are most important, those that are secondary, and those that are sort of like, okay, we can agree to disagree. So with that in mind, before we get too deep into, into all of that, let me just ask you this first question. Why don't we have, we have one Bible, why don't we have agreement on what the Bible says? Well, why don't we read in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, <laughs> this discussion probably won't be in the Bible very much, but we'll just give an idea that we're going to attempt to do that. Ephesians chapter 4, the, really the first, oh, uh, six verses. Paul says, that, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now this is the verse. Verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Yeah, so when, when you're looking at this, you say, okay, well, we, we know it's true. There is one body of doctrinal truth that the Lord gave to us through Scripture. And everybody would agree with that. But then from that, how come we have so much difference of opinion on so many biblical issues? And so what do we do about that? How do we explain it? Uh, the... These are just some of the questions uh, that I think we're going to try to explore uh, in uh, this section, possibly another session on, on this. Um, first off, why are there differences? Well, I think that it's like asking the question, which is a typical question. Sometimes when I'm in a, a doctrinal discussion over an issue and someone then says, as though this ends the discussion, mm. well... Good men differ on this issue. Mm. And the idea behind that statement is, because good men differ, there can be no one true answer. Mm. Yeah. And my point is, well, you, you obviously haven't been around the good men. <laughs> because in my experience, that is the, especially th w you know, with fellow teachers, when you, as you get, in a good sense, you develop a closer relationship mm -hmm. with them, you find out that there can be lots of reasons why men take or don't take certain views that sometimes have nothing to do with a careful biblical discussion. Mm -hmm. So let's just take an example. Um, many, many years ago, emphasis on the many at this point, I, in my uh, first church, I graduated from Covenant Theological Seminary, now the official seminary the presbyterian church in america and i was in cincinnati ohio and i changed what was i going to i changed my views on baptism from infant to believers baptism 
Okay. And this was back in, I think I actually had to leave like in the beginning of 1976. So, okay. So uh, now let's take that issue. Infant baptism, or the trendy way of saying it is credo baptism. Mm -hmm. I just see it sound more erudite. You know, <laughs> for that reason alone, we don't use it. <laughs> we want believer's baptism and infant baptism or pedo baptism. Yes. Pedo baptism. We want to get the the uh, the Greek word in there. But <clears throat> so this is uh, the issue. Now, when I changed my view on baptism, now I had given when I was ordained. Of course, in Presbyterian circles, it's a bit more involved getting ordained. You jump through hoop, but that's okay. But when I was ordained, I, I, I took ordination vow, and one and that vow says I would uphold the you know the standards of the what is now the PCA, which is the Westminster Confession of Faith, larger and shorter catechisms. Okay, and infant baptism, I clearly understood, was a non-negotiable item. There were some items within the Westminster Confession you could fudge on, but I knew that wasn't one. Okay, so when I changed my mind. You know how when you're uh, talking about an issue, when you're studying an issue, and you're reading with a book about it, and, and when you're reading it, you counter, uh, you know, ideas from your point of view, you know, as you're reading. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened with me was at some point as I was studying oh, this issue of baptism, all of a sudden, I just it dawned on me at one point that I had changed sides, mm -hmm. that I was now countering Scripture. I was now really pushing the believer's baptism perspective, whereas, of course, as Presbyterian, I, I previously held to the infant baptism mm -hmm. point of view. So I knew at that point, <laughs> A, I knew I was a dead duck. <laughs> I knew I, I was going to have to leave the church in Cincinnati. Um, I, you know, no place to go. So there's all sorts of questions. At that point, there's tremendous temptation. Because since then, you, you run across various guys who are in you know, Presbyterian denominations who are very conservative, Bible-believing, very sound in many ways, but sometimes, but they've, they've had struggles with infant baptism. Mm. But sometimes you hear guys almost explain it away that by the time they get done talking about infant baptism, it's like infant dedication, mm. which is a waterless baptism among Baptists, right. but we won't get into that. Um, and, uh, but what, what I noticed was guys were really fudging on being up, up front that they truly don't believe what the Westminster Confession says about infant baptism mm. anymore. They don't buy it. But they don't want to actually say so, because if you say so, you lose your livelihood. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, now we're talking about some sort of retirement. Uh, obviously, if you, you may, you know, you may end up losing your home if you, if you own one because you don't have any income. How is how, how you going to do any, any of this, especially if you're older in the faith, where we all know where there's, there's usually more to lose. Mm -hmm. You're older and you change your views. And so then what you find is, you find guys who are in these denominations, I'll use the PCA since that was my example, but their views really are un-PCA-like. Mm -hmm. But they don't really just come out and say so. You only find it out if you're spending time with them, all of a sudden, well, you know, they really don't hold to the Westminster on this. You go, well, you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to, if you change your views, you're supposed to tell Presbytery that you're a part of, you're supposed to tell them that you changed your views. Everything is supposed to be on the up and up. Well, in reality, it's not always on the up and up. I understand that. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So on this issue, so what I found is that some, quote, good guys... Uh, there's there's various reasons why they're they they stay let's say they stay within the PCA we use that as the example even though they've changed their view on infant baptism mm. if they really were up front they would be asked to be to be to leave but they don't because they don't want to lose their employment mm. simple as that I don't want to lose my financial security okay well then that is a reason that has nothing to do with the doctrinal study. And so you come up, so, so you have, you know, someone who's in their church says, well, this, my pastor, who's, I really respect highly, he, you know, he doesn't agree with you. And all of a sudden you say, well, yeah, but you should ask him why he doesn't. Because mm -hmm. actually he does agree with me, but he's, 
he doesn't want to pay the price to be honest on this issue. And, and there is, there's no doubt that when you're in a, a denominational group, there, is, there can be a severe price to be paid for changing your mind on a doctrinal issue. Mm. And I'm glad I had to go through it when I was younger. Not fun. Not, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. But it was a wonderful lesson for me um, to have to go through this whole process. And I had to go to... Um, they had in... Um, the way it was set up, I was what is called an organizing pastor. We'll make, we'll make this little autobiographical. I was an, or, an organizing pastor to get a, a new church on its feet in Cincinnati. And there was a, uh, the way it was set up, there was consultants maybe in, in four or five or six place, parts of the country. And my consultant worked for me to help me as I helped these people become a full-fledged church. Mm -hmm. And, and my consultant was a guy who I had a great relationship with, loved him dearly. He was a wonderful guy. He was tremendous help for me. And uh, so when I changed my mind, I knew first I had to call him. Mm -hmm. And he was just a dear friend. And so he came, dropped what he was doing. He had to drive. I don't know how many hours he had to drive to come to see me. Mm -hmm. And I remember he came to our apartment, and he sat down, and for about three hours we talked. And it's interesting... And, and, you know, I'm sure he had some real disappointment in me that here I was changing on such a basic Presbyterian issue. And, uh, but it's interesting, at, at the end of that period of time, uh, two things happened. One is, is that it's not that I answered his questions perfectly for, to his satisfaction. Mm -hmm. But at the end of that three-hour discussion, I wasn't... Uh, what's the word? I wasn't disturbed about my decision to change. Mm. I wasn't disturbed. Let me ask you a question, though, yeah. because it, 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 and maybe some of our viewers are thinking of this as well. It, it, we're talking denominations, we'll go to that in a minute, but that aside, you came to a place where you no longer believed in infant or pedo baptism, but you believed in believer baptism. Right. Did, how did you know, or how could you know you are right and the other is wrong? Ah. All, uh, that is a great question. All you can do is to say, at this point in time, I am convinced of this position. That's all I can say. Sure. Because when I came to the infant baptism position, which I earlier in my early days in seminary, I came to the. I was convinced at that time that that was correct. Now stop, stop you there again. You were convinced of that because you're going to a Presbyterian or what was yeah. became a seminary who they're all telling you, feeding you the verses and the logic and everything That's else. That's all true. That, so, but the other, the paid or the uh, rather credo or the believer's baptism position that you came to hold, and by the way, still hold. Yeah. Um, you came to on your own. Yes. And so looking back now, what helped was that. You know, at this time, of course, the denomination I was in was technically was not the PCA because it was the Reformed Presbyterian Church Evangelical Synod. And they were merged with the PCA in the mid-80s. But we're talking like 75, 76. So I was in the Pittsburgh Presbytery. It's not a big denomination, so it was spread out. Cincinnati is in the Pittsburgh. It was the outer Mongolia of the Pittsburgh Presbytery. Okay, long, long drive to Pittsburgh. Mm. So what that meant was I was pretty much on my own. Now the posit the downside of that was not a lot of de denominational pastoral fellowship. The positive side was when I was going through this uh, re-examination of baptism, I, I had a great freedom uh, that I, I'm sort of freed up from all sides just mm. to sort of examine because per Priscilla, our, my wife, her dad was the pastor of a large church in Wheaton, Illinois at the time. He was believers baptism, so family mm. pressure. So, pressure, but seminary, and we'll go back to when I was in seminary and I embraced infant baptism, as you pointed out, you like to think you're being objective, mm -hmm. that's true, but there's tr there was tremendous uh, informal pressure mm -hmm. to conform. I mean, there is. A student body, when I went there, it was relatively small, 110, 120 students. Uh, all your friends are there. Mm -hmm. All the professors who you greatly admire 
are teaching you. They all hold this position. Uh, the books you're reading, you know, mm -hmm. some of the great covenant theology, theological works, which are, which are great, mm -hmm. uh, all these guys hold to this position. So there's, there is tremendous informal pressure to conform. Mm -hmm. Find a way to fit in. Mm -hmm. You want to find a way to fit in. And, and I'm sure that was true with me. Because it's when I got away and I, and I began to restudy the issue, I think I, I was able, because of my first, my geographic location, I was able to be much more objective. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not as though it, the easy way out was believer's baptism. That was by far not the easy way out. Mm -hmm. But I think I was more objective at that point. But once again, we're all product of that because when I embraced infant baptism, I honestly thought that I was trying to be biblically faithful. Mm -hmm. And when I changed my view on baptism to believer's baptism, I, my thoughts were the same. I'm going, I want to be um, biblically faithful. I should just kind of add that little anecdote about that when, when I met with a consultant. His name was DeWitt Watson. I only say that because I have such fond memories of him just as a person. He's just a godly guy, just tremendous. And he, was a, he helped me tremendously. But uh, and he, but what was neat was at the end of that, and of course, as far as I know, Dwight never left the Presbyterian mm -hmm. Church. But he 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 handled me with tremendous love, mm -hmm. tremendous love, and uh, he was just a genuine help. But of course, after that, then I had to notify Presbytery, mm -hmm. and then I so then I had to go to the next Presbytery meeting in Pittsburgh. I had to go through the committee on on ordination, and I had to be grilled. Mm -hmm. you know, here I was. Then I had to go to the floor of Presbytery and be grilled. And then they finally, with deep regret, you know, that acknowledged that I, you know, I was leaving. Mm. Wow. And, uh, and they gave me two weeks to leave. <laughs> two weeks. With pay? <laughs> yeah. But it was, yes, it was with pay. Well, before we started this, I did ask this question. It is sort of a chicken and the egg, but I said, which came first, denominations? And then doctrinal differences, or did doctrinal differences lead to denomination? I think there is a, a log logical progression in that people get doctrinal differences which result in different denominations. Okay. So that's one. But then two, as you grow up in denominations, your family-wise, mm -hmm. you tend to take on the views of the denomination without even thinking. It's like osmosis. You just take it in. And so you grow up in a... I mean, even just for even theological kinds of churches. Let's say, because where we are in the Southwest, dispensational churches. Mm -hmm. You grow up in an independent church, but it's dispensational, which is that's the Bible church, rather typical. Right. And you just take on their views, whether it's end times views mm -hmm. or whatever. You take on those views because you, without even thinking about it. Now, hopefully, if you become a real believer and you get grounded, you begin to think more critically about everything you th you think you believe and you re-examine it in light of scripture well that's ideally what we should go through you know s some do some do it partially whatever mm -hmm. so so that's uh you know that's my explanation but going back you know to your question even today and you know all of my doctrinal peculiarities but even today my answer is still the same what you know, we have um, at New Covenant Bible Fellowship, we have and end up studies is all tied in on, on the, the rather extensive confession. Mm -hmm. We have that available on our the end up studies website right. and on the church website. And people say, Well, you know, what's the good thing and bad thing about confessions? Mm -hmm. And there are, I think, there are good and bad. I think coming out of a Presbyterian circle is the bad thing about confessions is that, let's use the PCA, for example, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a lot of wonderful things in it, but it reflected covenant theology in England in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. It was a snapshot of what they believed. Well, okay, unless you say they've got it all together, and really I don't think any Presbyterian really th thinks that, um, the idea is, but to change the confession today, within the PCA is such a involved process that in reality it's almost impossible to change. Okay. As a result, if you have a doctrinal dispute in your church 
at the end of the day, the final determiner is not the Bible of, what's, uh, of what direction you're going to go. It's not the Bible, it's the confession. Mm. And now that is the scary part. And I have good friends who are in the PCA, pastors. They're just godly guys. That's not the point. But what I'm saying is, is that if you follow the rules, Book of Order, and Presbyterian setup, that, you know, you, well, you know, you can only go so far if the confession doesn't allow you to go any further on an issue. It mm. won't allow you to change. Mm. So even if you think the Bible's taking you in another direction, you know, as far as that Presbyterian church, you can only go so far. We had this discussion with a dear guy who, who uh, years ago at a Christian school, high school, on a friendly little debate about um, baptism, mm -hmm. infant versus believers. And it was the students in the class were asking questions. Good time. But we, I think I would, must have asked some sort of question where I, in a kind of way, at least I hope it was kind, I was sort of pushed my friend on an issue, on this issue. And he, and he got to the point, he says, I can go no further in my answer. I am confessionally bound. Mm. And I'm thinking, oh, that's not, I don't think that's a good thing, because I want to be able, at the end of the day, to be biblical. Right. So in our church, we have this extensive, you know, confessional document, which we do, very detailed. People, But all that is, that is a snapshot of what all the teaching at New Covenant Bible Fellowship and End Up Studies is coming from at this point in time. Well, that document has been changed. Oh, yeah, the document is easy to change by and by design. We don't need all the states to ratify it. No, we don't. Now. It's easy. If we just have among the elders, we just, if we agree among ourselves, we change that baby overnight. Mm -hmm. So the, all that is, that is the current, uh, current understanding of the Bible, the leadership of New Covenant Bible Fellowship and In-Depth Studies. That is the current understanding mm -hmm. today. That's really all it is. Right. And, uh, but the Bible is the authority, so the Bible sits in judgment on the confession, and if we think the Bible at some point takes us different direction, we just alter the confession, mm -hmm. and we move on. So I think that that's sort of a bit of a roundabout discussion, but I think it's relevant to what we're dealing with here. You know, why do good men differ on a doctrinal issue? Mm -hmm. There's lots of reasons why good men differ, and... Um, and a lot of the differences have nothing to do with uh, biblical discussion. Mm. But that's that's another, another issue. Well, as we said, that we, I referred in the very beginning to an article or post, whatever it was, by Albert Mohler. He um, broke down doctrinal differences amongst believers in three sort of categories. And he used a the um, medical triage as sort of his model, and I won't go into all that, but it, triage, if you don't know what that is, if some horrible catastrophe event happens or in wartime out on the battlefield, they will take patients in and they will make fast, quick, immediate decisions. Who needs, who needs, who's the most severely injured, needs attention right away, or they're going to die, and the poor guy over here with the broken leg and a lot of pain, he's just got to wait his turn, you know, that, that kind of a thing. Well, illustration, we broke, we grew up watching MASH. MASH, of course. There yes, we go, that, there we that go. That was it in, 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 in blazing color. But, but I thought it was fascinating because what he talked about, he did it from this perspective, and this is what I really liked about it. He's saying, how do we as believers, or at least professed believers, deal with one another when it comes to these issues? And the way he defined it was, there are there certain, we'll call them type one, or uh, differences that will completely not allow, it will basically prohibit us from engaging in any kind of real fellowship or worship or whatever, because these differences are so stark. And yes. we'll talk about those in a couple yeah. minutes. Yeah. The second level are those differences in doctrine uh, that we hold to where we can still you know, have fellowship, we might be able to go to go to a church set, service with it, whatever, but we wouldn't be able to serve, say, in, in the role of elders at that particular church or leadership, and, and they maybe couldn't in ours. So it's that idea. The third are sort of the, you know, the everyday, you know, kind of um, things where I don't really, you know, end times is a perfect example. You may hold to, a, or, or better yet, creation, because my wife loves creation stuff. You may hold to a literal seven-day creation. 
And I may hold to an older age. Huh? Right. You're older. younger right. You older. got the long beard. You gotta yeah, be the oldest yeah. guy. I was there when it happened. I'm Come clean on. shaven. I'm <laughs> the youngest guy. But those are the kind of things where we can we can be elders on the same, yeah. on the same, same board and yet still hold some very d different, slight different understandings. Sure. Right. So those are the three categories. But so the, back to the original question, what your uh, um, story, your little biographical story, is is certainly stage one because in that setting, that doctrinal difference was fundamental. You can't serve any longer in that, this church. Using Al Muller's one, two, or three, yeah. it would have been a two because I couldn't uh, be... I couldn't be a pastor in the PCA and hold my new view right. on baptism. That's absolutely true. That also breaks our time's just about up here okay. for this one. But and we'll use this as springboard. We'll pick this all up in our next session. But the idea that in this, you, the old ditty, in essentials, unity, in non, non-essentials, liberty, in all things, love. Mm. Which, once again, sounds good. But, of course, who's defining essentials, who's <laughs> defining non-essentials? We will discuss that, because that's all involved in this when we get back together again. Right, sounds good. I hope you've enjoyed this so far. I look forward to uh, sharing the next part of this with you next time. But, as always, if you have any questions or comments, you can always get a hold of Jeff. Uh, Jeff, the best way is? Uh, my phone number is 480-313-8558. My email address is volker.jeff at gmail.com. Skype, Skype number is just Jeff Volker with no space in between. Uh, I'm easy to get hold of and glad to talk with you. Yeah, And as always, if you'd like to support this ministry, there's information right there on the website where you can do just that. Uh, otherwise, we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.